Shalom, my good friends. Yom Kippur is behind us. Yesterday was the great day of purity, of forgiveness. And Baruch Hashem, we have passed it with success. And all that remains is the great hope that God indeed accepted our prayers. I mean, in many synagogues, people screamed when they said, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. When they said, Hashem Wa Elokim, Hashem Wa Elokim. There's no question about it. Sha'am Israel, the people of Israel are very special. And the day of Yom Kippur is the greatest gift that God gave us. One day, forgiveness is given to us, is extended to us. Of course, one, one has to be careful to persist in that which he gained yesterday. Of course, in a day or so, Shabbat is coming, and we will be reading the parasha of Ha'azinu HaShamayim Ba'adabera V'tishma Ha'aretz Imrefi. The parasha of Ha'azinu, usually, in most of the years, it happens on the ten days of Teshuvah, which means between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. This year is different. Ha'azinu comes after Kippur, when Vayelech, which we read last week, came between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. But there is always a connection. You see, Parashat Azinu is also a parasha which is very small. It's a poetical parasha. But the poetry contains in it tremendous rebuke that Moses gave the Jewish people before he died. Rebuking us? Why should he rebuke us? We just had the Yom Kippur. We have been relieved from our sins. Thank God. Not only that, there is another question. Yesterday night, at the end of Kippur, at the end of Ne'ilah, when we blew the shofar, Yom Kippur is over. But immediately we have to start the prayer of the weekdays, at night, Arvit. And how do we start it? By reciting the words, Vehu Rahum Yechaper Avon. He, God, the compassionate, may He forgive our sins. What sins? We just finished with all the sins. I mean, we became pure after Yom Kippur. Every Jew who meant it, meant it to be forgiven and to do some kind of repentance has been forgiven. So, there's no, no more uh, sins left after Kippur, I mean that night. So why do we say, May Hashem forgive the sins. I heard once a rabbi who said, I think it was Rabbi Ephraim Ankawa from Morocco, and he explained that people usually, immediately after they hear the shofar, are immediately going. They run home. They don't wait for Arvit, for the prayer of Arvit. To a certain degree, I, I believe that Arvit, after all the prayers of Yom Kippur, why do, why do we need also Arvit? Neila is also at night, it finishes at night. So why do we need Arvit? Perhaps to see whether Yom Kippur was a total success or maybe something is lacking since our beginning again. And one of the, one of the proofs is that people, I mean, I'm not talking about people who are religious, thank God, here in Yerushalayim, people, you don't have the blood of shofar, and then they start praying with the same dexterity, with the same sincerity, and with the same happiness. They pray, Arvit. But most Jews, unfortunately, I was a rabbi in Co-op City with a large community on Yom Kippur, and I remember 
As soon as they blew the shofar, immediately people ran away. I hardly stayed with a minion to say Arvid, until one day I decided to blow the shofar after Arvid. Whether it was wrong or not, I don't know. But that was the only way that kept them inside, because the Jew is a, is a Jew anyway. But still, it's a sin. Not to do Arvid is a sin. That's why we, the first thing we say is, please God, uh, you are the compassionate, and therefore forgive our sins. What sins? You just started to sin again. I could explain that in a very easy way. You see, our sages said that on the day of Yom Kippur, uh, Satan, Satan, has no supremacy. Which means he, he does not exist, so to speak. When Satan exists every day, boy oh boy, what he does with us. But on Yom Kippur, I, I, I assume that what they meant, what the sages meant, is that he, well, of course he is present. He's present all the time, till the last minute of life. Why Yom Kippur there is no... People are more in the synagogues, they are uh, fasting, so of course the opportunity to perform, to do a sin, is difficult. But that doesn't mean there is no evil inclination, there is Yetzirah. But I would say it is, the Yetzirah is weaker on the day of Yom Kippur. And that's the reason why most people will not think about, say, about sinning on the day of Yom Kippur. That's why uh, Yom Kippur is a great gift, no question about it. It's a great opportunity, especially if we add with it the thought of uh, repentance, true repentance. True rep repentance guarantees that your sins are really forgiven and you start anew after Yom Kippur. We have to 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 say thank you to the Lord for giving us the day of Yom Kippur. I think there was somebody who asked me a question, why is it that Yom Kippur happens every year? It should have been only once in 70 years. I told him if he would wait for 70 years to, to give us a Yom Kippur, there would be so many sins that, that would accumulate throughout the 70 years and I don't think Yom Kippur would have enough power to forgive. Of course, I'm saying this as half a joke. We need it every year, of course. So now, after Yom Kippur, we are, Baruch Hashem, granted forgiveness with the possibility of sinning again. So now, our sages said that Satan, Satan, in Hebrew, has a numerical value of 354. Shin, that's 300. Tet, of Satan. Tet is 9, and Nun is 50. So we have 300, no, but I'm sorry, has Satan, the Satan. So He is also another 5. So together you have 354, 64, I'm sorry, 364. Now we need only one to complete the year, 365 days in the year, right? But our sages said that there is one day, which is the day of Yom Kippur, that Satan does not exist. What I am explaining that it's not that he does not exist, only he is weaker. He doesn't have the same strength. Why? Because Jews are more now subdued by the greatness of the day, Yom Kippur. They all come to synagogues and they all fast. Even non-religious Jews fast. I just read in the papers that uh, there were some Israelis, a group of Israelis who decided to fast, despite the fact that they proclaim and they declare we don't believe in God, but we will, we will fast because it's, it's nice, it's Masoretic, it's a tradition, very nice. <laughs> of course, they are stupid to say that, but I would prefer to say 
that despite the fact that they say they don't believe in God, but God is inside, they do believe in God. But they are too proud to say that they believe. The arrogance is killing them. Ay, 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 pride. What pride does to the people. Most people who are not religious is only if you check very deeply, you will find that it's because of pride. They are not willing to admit. I remember in the University of Jerusalem, once I met a student of mathematics, very clever guy. So we became engaged in this discussion of regarding emunah, regarding faith. He says, I have no faith. I don't believe in God. So I did not leave him alone. I mean, I stayed with him for a while, discussing further. I kept telling him, it's impossible, one has to be stupid not to believe. How can you not believe? Just look upon the sky and look upon the earth, look upon everything. There is nothing in the world that does not have a plan and purpose. He knows all that. But he kept saying, I don't believe. But at the end, he was forced to say, what I mean to say is I don't want to believe. That's what most people who say they do not believe, that's what they mean. Because when you say, I believe, you know that immediately you are under the responsibility, the obligation to do things, to, do, to perform the mitzvot, right? To pray to God. But they cannot. Their evil inclination is too big. And their arrogance is even bigger. So that's why they prefer to say, I don't believe. Don't believe any Jew who says he does not believe. Believe rather in his evil inclination that makes him do so. But on the day of Yom Kippur, everyone forgets his arrogance, and, or at least partially, and he comes to the synagogue and he fasts, because inside him he knows that he is missing a lot. By the way, you know, among, especially among the Sephardim, I don't know, they buy the mitzvot. Great sums of money are being donated on the day of Yom Kippur. On the day of Yom Kippur, for example, the Gabai, he sells the opening of the sanctuary, of the Hechal. One says a hundred, the other one says it goes up to one thousand. Two thousand! Yesterday, someone bought it for 3,000 shekel in America, dollars and more, more than that. Every single mitzvah to hold the Torah will cost money, which is not common in any day, except on Yom Kippur. Why? You, should dis you, you will see something that is almost clear. Most of those who donate so much money, ne'ilah, I remember when it was sold for, for $10,000. I even heard in some communities, rich communities, where uh, even $100,000. Ne'ila, just the opening of the door of the sanctuary. For Ne'ila, that's the culminating point of Yom Kippur. Why? Because inside the people who are not religious, there is something that tells them that they are wrong. But as I say, as soon as the day passes, the evil inclination comes back, Satan comes back with tremendous force. That's why we start the prayer of Ma'ariv with the words, You compassionate God, you have forgive us our sins. What sins? I mean, we just uh, were completely cleaned of any sin. We were cleansed. Well, at the end, after we blow the shofar, people already regain that uh, evil inclination. And they start again. And today, and more and more. Hopefully, something remains from the day of Yom Kippur, of course. Anyway, I'm compelled to continue in this subject, which is very important, no question about it, but we have a parasha to deal with, parashat azinu. So it has, it has a connection with the, usually it falls in Shabbat Shuvah, which is between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, except this year, happened. 
it happens but there is a connection the connection is that this parasha talks about rebuking the Jewish people what rebuke? why do you have to reprimand them when only yesterday was so to speak was Yom Kippur of course, was, Moses was talking to the people of Israel in general, in all the generations. Before he died, he was giving them a discourse, a poetical discourse. And he said to them, Ha'azinu ha'shamayim v'adabera v'tishma' ha'aretz imrefi. Give ear, O heavens, and let the earth listen. You might think it's only poetical expression, as Rabbi Avigdor Miller writes in his book. Fortunate nation on the Sefer Devarim, but in fact these are a, a declaration of a principle of the greatest importance, says the Rabbi. First, you have to understand. He says he explains. First, we have to look upon the sky, the universe, and realize that this universe has been created by someone, by a great force that we call Hashem. That's number one. And then he says, if that's the case, el he says in the parasha, and yet you allowed yourself to forget him. How can you forget someone who has given you your own creation? el that's what it says in this parasha. It has to do with Yom Kippur. People have to, rem have to remember. One of the biggest problems that we have is that we forget. God created forgetfulness. There is a special angel. He's called Malach HaShikha. The, the angel of forgetfulness. We forget. On the day of Yom Kippur we remember somehow. After Yom Kippur, again, we fall into the darkness of forgetting Hashem and forgetting our obligations. I'm not saying everyone, but the majority, unfortunately, we come back again after Yom Kippur. Yalla, we start again. Everyone with his temptations, everyone with his decisions, and so forth. Everyone with his opinions. What opinions? There is only one opinion. El emunab en avel tzaddik v'yashar, who this parasha says. That God is a God of emunah. You have to believe in God. That's one, uh, one meaning. But God also is his strength. He does not change. You know, some nations thought that he changed a nation. From Israel he went to the other nations. God forbid. The Torah explicitly says that God will never give up on the Jewish people, despite the fact that he knows that the Jewish people is not, is not innocent in all times. But God already promised, Even if they make me disgusted of them, I still will not relinquish them, because I, am, I already chose them to be my people. So let the nations believe whatever, whatever they want to believe. The day is coming when the nations also will start believing that there is only one God. The day is coming when the nations will start saying, Shema Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, God is one. You cannot say God is this Muhammad or this uh, Islam or Christianity or Buddhist, nothing. They will come to their senses. By the way, I'll share with you an information. Go to the Kotel Amaravi, to the Western Wall in Jerusalem. You will find that so many, there is a whole population of non-Jews who go there to pray there. I have seen Japanese people, I have seen Chinese people, African people, black people. I have seen all kinds of nations, even from Korea. People who are standing before the wall and writing also their piece of paper to insert inside the, the stones of the wall. Why? Because they also know the truth. Perhaps this truth did not reach everyone, but many of them, and the number is growing. 
I will never forget just a while ago I had a bar mitzvah at the Kotel at the Western Wall on, on Monday when we read the Torah. And there are so many people are there, unbelievable. Every day. But I have noticed that there are many non-Jews also climbing over the partition to look further into what's going on among the section of the men. And I was right there at, uh, you know, on the other side of the partition. And the lady was uh, hanging uh, on the top, looking with great interest. When she saw that I, wa I was waiting for the people to bring the Torah to be read, so I had a few minutes of quiet, and the lady addressed me, and she said, Sir, I think she said Rabbi, maybe, Sir, can you explain to me a little more what's going on? I immediately understood that she is not Jewish. But I appreciated. I gave her respect. I explained as, as much as I could. But I have noticed her eyes and her face. She looked with, with great interest. And she, I have noticed in her eyes that she was a believer. A believer in what? Right now in those, that are, those things that are sanctified to the Jewish people. And I have even noticed some kind of jealousy. Who knows? So many non-Jews are converting. There is a reason, right? They know the truth. Even Arabs know the truth. Our fiercest enemies today, right? And yet they know the truth. Why do you think they hate us so much? Why do you think the world has so much hatred against us? There must be a reason. You look for a reason, you cannot find a reason. Of course, they will start inventing all kinds of reasons. We control the monies of the world. Shtuyot, nonsense. They know that the Jewish people has accepted its role in the world to be a light of the nations despite our mistakes. The reason they hate us is because they know the truth. Otherwise, why would they hate us? What have we done to them? Except bringing great benefits to the nations where we, where we stayed for so many years, 2,000 years, we were in exile. And still the majority of the Jewish people uh, call it exile or not, but are still dispersed all over the nations. Only today they are coming back. We, still, we have now, thank God, the state of Israel. And we are waiting for the day of redemption. We are not asking for any revenge for whatever they did to us. God knows. He is the one who will decide whether there is a revenge or not. All we want is the prophecies that are written in the Bible by Isaiah, by Yechezkel, by Yermia, by Zechariah, and, and more, and Amos. That all these prophecies should come true, and most of them have come true, and one of them is the, the ingathering of the Jews from the exiles. We have seen it, and we are seeing it every day. But there is another one, another prophecy, when the nations will join us. Now, it sounds very presumptuous, right? Whether we like it or not, that's what's going to be. And we already see, go to the Kotel Amaravi, you will see it. I have seen African women, black women, going with their, with their hands like this, praying like this, at the Kotel Amaravi. Why is that? Because everyone knows the truth including the Jews. Only the Jews find the truth more difficult than, than non-Jews. That's why you have, especially in the land of Israel, Jews who are anti-religious. Why anti-religious? You go to, in America, I have met many non-religious Jews, but they, they, they are not anti-religious. On the contrary, they respect religious Jews. So why in Israel? Let me explain this point. Israel is the holy land. The Zohar, the Holy Zohar says, wherever there is great sanctity, well, 
prepare yourself that there is also the same, at least the same force of sanctity, there is a force of impurity that joins. It's called in the Kabbalah, Klipot. That they want to interfere. It's in the Holy Land, it's more difficult to be religious than in outside the land of Israel. Didn't I see it with my own eyes? So many Jews have uh, become religious in America. And I'm sure everywhere in the world. Even in Venezuela. I, went to, I was invited in Venezuela a year, many years ago. When you could not see one single Torah scholar. Today go there, you will find several houses in which scholars are being, are studied. And uh, Baruch Hashem, there is more religion everywhere. That's the way it is. But the Goim also, the non-Jews also know the truth. And therefore, there is such a prophecy that one day they will join the Jewish people. Kulam nikbetsu ba'ulach, in the words of the prophet. They will all gather and they will come for, to, uh, to every Jew to ask him, Teach us, please, how to fulfill the mitzvah of tzitzit, of the talit. The Gemara says, the Talmud says, Masrit Abu Dazara and elsewhere, it says there that in the beginning God is going to give them all the, the non Jews who are going to want to, who are interested to join the Jewish people, God is going to start by giving them a very easy commandment, a very easy mitzvah which is building the sukkah. You know, in, in, in about four days, we are going to start celebrating the day of happiness, the day of Sukkot, when we build the huts. So God is going to give them that as the first mitzvah, the little one. Why? Because it doesn't cost much money to build the sukkah, it's only a hut. Also, it does not require much, and then they're on the contrary, you could enjoy in it, and then eat, and then be happy. But what God added also, the Talmud says, that now he increased the heat of the day. Became extremely hot. I'm told that uh, in a few days on Sukkot, it's going to be extremely hot, 32 degrees temperature, Celsius, of course. And then many, many non-Jews, after they build the sukkah, they can take it, it's too hard, too hot. That's a dikim, of course. Uh, Jews are not complaining, they will stay in. But those who are freshly uh, converted or, or uh, wanting to convert, they are going to kick the, the walls of the sukkah and go out, it's too hot. So that's God, that's the way of God to see, to give you, a, 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 to, to experiment with you, whether you are authentically sincere or not. But, as I said, the prophecy says that the non-Jews will join us, and then the Jewish people will be, will be again re-established, not as a nation that will take revenge for all the suffering that we have suffered, but for they will become again the nation who will become a light to the nations, which means the nations are in the darkness. Even in Israel there is great darkness. But this darkness, darkness is going to be to dissipate. And then the world will see the light. And then they will see how important is the Jewish people. Because as long as the Jewish people is alive, everyone knows that there is a God. That's why they wanted so much to destroy the Jewish people. Because they wanted to destroy the image of God. They don't want a God. There are many things to say about this, but no time. But little by little they realize that if there is a Jew, one Jew left, that means there is a God. Because the Jews are here to represent God. To teach the very tea, the truth of Hashem. Like Abraham, the father of all the nations, has taught the world that there is only one God. And that's what shall be. Soon, I believe, I'm not predicting, I'm not the prophet. But it looks that most of the prophecies have been fulfilled. And now 
There is a few more prophecies to be prophecies, and the events of every day are teaching us what I am saying, that it looks like it is the beginning of the redemption and the coming of the Mashiach. And the world wants to know the truth. Why did Hitler want to destroy? Why did he kill so many Jews? Because he didn't want God. He was godless. Some say he was a Satan himself. So on Yom Kippur, Satan does not exist, but he does exist, but he's weaker. On such a day, we are closer to God than any other time. So that's why the prophet says, Dir shu Hashem vehim matzo ke ra'uhu bihiyoto karob. Seek God while he is to be found. Where? In your heart. Which means when you think of him. Because God is found all the time. But people don't have God all the time in their heart. But when you feel there is a God there, grab it. Ke ra'uhu bihiyoto karob. Call upon him when he is close to you. He is close to us all the time. But you are not close to him. On Yom Kippur, we are close to him. That's why we call upon him. Yesterday was a great day. So many Jews, young and old, and everyone. You should have seen the section of the women praying with such devotion. Of course, I am not saying that in every place you see the same thing. But here in Yerushalayim, there is such a thing. And you saw... You practically saw the presence of God. You felt it when they screamed, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. When they said, Hashem Hu HaElokim, Hashem Hu HaElokim, they said it with such a sincerity, even if it is only for, for a while, for a day. But this was enough to prove that we, the Jewish nation, is the nation that has been chosen to be the light of the nations, despite the fact that it cost us so much suffering. But we know the Jewish people, Chai, Am Israel Chai. It's a living entity. It cannot die. No matter how much they tried, they could not succeed to finish with us. Even today, there are nations that believe that they can destroy us. Iran. It's not going to help. Maybe we can suffer. Maybe we will suffer. Because we are not the best. I mean, we are not uh, 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 righteous. Not all of us. And that's why suffering is always possible. We pray that it, we shouldn't suffer that much any, anyway. Even the coming of the Mashiach, of the Messiah, might be uh, accompanied with all kinds of suffering. Maybe tremendous fear. Because this is needed for, the, for many Jews to return, to repent, to say, Shema Israel. But it's coming. And let's hope it's not going to be with any big fears or any big threats or any big wars. Let's hope for the best. But the nations will see the truth very soon. God bless you. The holiday of Sukkot that's coming is the holiday of happiness for the Jewish people. It's a holiday of joy. Zeman Shimchatenu. Time of our joy. Let us be joyous and happy during the eight days of Chag Sukkot, including Simchat Torah, Shmini Atzeret, and so forth, Zman Simchatenu, and I pray that uh, happiness will enter every Jewish heart in the world, in the whole world, and may God inscribe all of us in the book of life, in the book of health, in the book of happiness. Amen.